Hey, this is just a quick note about our sponsor, Pravado, the premier enterprise privacy platform, purpose-built to bridge the gap between privacy and engineering. Its privacy code scanning solution embeds privacy compliance and governance into the product development lifecycle and empowers privacy and security teams with unparalleled visibility of sensitive data flows and the insights to find and fix privacy vulnerabilities. You can leverage Provado's data flows, dynamic data mapping, privacy assessment automation, and real-time visibility of privacy issues. Enter the era of proactive privacy and transform privacy from business blocker to business enabler. To learn more, go to provado.ai. Hello, I am Deborah J. Farber. Welcome to the Shifting Privacy Left podcast, where we talk about embedding privacy by design and default into the engineering function to prevent privacy harms to humans and to prevent dystopia. Each week, we'll bring you unique discussions with global privacy technologists and innovators working at the bleeding edge of privacy research and emerging technologies, standards, business models, and ecosystems. On today's episode, we welcome Stephen Wilson, an accomplished innovator, researcher, analyst, and advisor in data protection, and one of the world's most original thinkers in identity. Stephen has over 35 years of R&D experience in Australia and the United States, with 27 of those years dedicated to data protection and digital identity specifically. Stephen leads the digital safety and privacy efforts at Silicon Valley-based Constellation Research, where he covers data protection, digital identity, authentication technologies, blockchain and DLT technologies, and privacy engineering. Stephen is also the managing director of Lockstep Consulting, where he, his work is centered at the heart of what we now call verified information. In this episode, we discuss Stephen's assertion that privacy is about restraint, what you choose not to know about people, the trend of creating data sharing platforms to facilitate and scale global information value chains, how if data is like crude oil, then it requires safe handling, and why we should all treat data more like clean drinking water instead, the importance of data quality, data originality, and data lineage, Stephen's analysis of the growing market for data protection as a service, which includes data clean rooms, privacy APIs, and more. And lastly, why you don't need to own your own data to get good privacy outcomes. Enjoy the episode. Hello, Stephen. Welcome. Hey, Deborah. Great to be with you. Good to see you again. And thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And um, just a note, my listeners, that you're calling from down under in Australia, uh, where you're based. And um, I'd love to, you know, to hear a little bit about who you are and the work that you do at both Lockstep Consulting and Constellation Research. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. So I have conjoint roles in those two organizations. Lockstep is my own business in Australia, and I've been doing that for 17 or 18 years. I got into what we call digital identity in 1995 as a R&D leader at a startup company doing PKI, public key infrastructure, which was all about what we thought at the time was identity in things like smart cards and SIM cards and early technology like that. So that became a digital identity industry pretty quickly. We've been trying to figure out what you need to know about people how to equip individuals to prove things about themselves online and to allow businesses to know who they're dealing with, to like prove those things that, that, that are being presented. And that all adds up to this thing, which we call identity. And I'm being a little bit cagey about the term identity because I think we'll unpack this, Deborah, as we go, but I think that the term is being um, reimagined. So, look, I started in PKI, as I said, smart cards, um, e-signatures, e-signature law uh, at the dawn of e-commerce. So this is in the late 1990s. And if I could tell you the quick story about how I got into privacy in the, in the early noughties. Please. Yeah, well, look, I found a, an absolute privacy mess at an organisation that I was helping. The mess resulted from a, a total breakdown, not just in communication, but of just imagination between lawyers and engineers working on privacy. There was just, they were speaking completely different languages. And I recognised that 
you know, identity is what you need to know about people to be able to deal with them. And that's that's transactional. Like, you know, we're talking about online identity and it is a bit transactional. It's only a snapshot, you know, of true human identity. So I want to acknowledge that. But if, if online identity is what do you need to know about people, then privacy is what do you not need to know about people? You know, how do you exercise restraint? How do you choose not to know things about people and still be able to do business with them? So that's sort of my game. I've, I've been an R&D leader, a consultant, and an independent researcher now. It's unusual to see privacy experts have a role of R&D leader. So could you, you know, describe a little bit about what that means in the context of the type of work that you're doing? Oh, you bet. Good question, because privacy has been dominated, I think, by lawyers and legal thinking. And that's fine. I mean, I like lawyers. Um, I think that it's really important. But I think the privacy to me is about, well, look, let me let me just say, fundamentally, I think that privacy is about restraint. It's about what do you not need to know about people? What do you choose to not know about people and still be able to deal with them? And that's sort of a funny orientation that brings privacy and security together because security is about the need to know and data minimization. And these are fundamentals about privacy, aren't they? Um, Choose not to know things about people. So if you look at data privacy, and again, I, I think I want to pay respect to the bigger human rights issue in privacy and dignity and acknowledge that data privacy is like a slice of that. But it's an important slice because everything we do these days is online and digital and and therefore about data. So data privacy is about information flows. It's about controlling information flow, minimizing information flow, being visible and transparent about how you use information, how you disclose information, and ultimately how do you destroy personal information when you finish with it. So in those terms, it is about informatics and That's why I think some R&D and some information science and information practice is really important because if you want to map out information flows in the business and know about the covert and subtle and side effect of information flows as well as the obvious stuff, then I think it does become a bit of an engineering problem. Now, this is where the sort of engineering and the privacy law can come together in a really constructive way. So Certainly, ever since I found that mess at the client 20 years ago, I've I've been working to try and bring engineers and IT professionals and and lawyers and policy people to the same table. And that's my orientation. That's how I come at this problem. I love it. I love it because we're not really used to hearing people talk about privacy as a restraint. We really hear about privacy as agency and I know we're going to talk about control later, but our privacy as control over information, privacy as about respecting what people want to share. But we typically don't hear about what do you not need to know about people? And I think that's a great segue to what we're going to talk about today, which is discussing trends regarding the sharing of data to facilitate and scale global information value chains. And so you've stated that there's a global push on multiple fronts to facilitate more sharing in in, in the past in some of your publications. You know, what organizations are pushing for this and and why? Let me say everybody. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. You know, there's, there's some terrible analogies or contested analogies about data being like the new crude oil, et cetera. I actually kind of like that one because it it speaks to the to the value of data and it speaks to the business of data. And I think that we should confront that sort of thing because a lot of the business of data obviously is terrible and underhanded and asymmetrical and not doing people a service. And I get that. The thing about the crude oil analogy is that, you know, all of that asymmetry and the robber barons taking advantage of people, that was the story of oil 100 years ago. So it's interesting to see how we can try and do better on the next wave of business. I mean, what are we in now? The industrial revolution number four or something. And um, yeah, let's look at the previous industrial revolutions and see if we can do this one better. Yeah. And to that point, the, the you know, in talking about that data is crude oil analogy, which at times I think has broken down as an analogy. But if we're going to say that data is crude oil, 
then we also have to talk about the toxicity of crude oil if it spills yep. or you know it leaks the risks around it the the fact i think a lot of the big data economy proponents had really championed the you know more data is is better cuz that's just more value yeah. that you can do something with in the future without thinking about how do we make sure that we have valuable data that isn't offset by the toxicity of the breaches, the spillage, the privacy harms caused to humans as a result? 100%. 100%. There's a, a discussion there that we need to have about the quality of data as well as the quantity of data. So I think the infomopolists, the people that trying to get as much data about us as possible and stockpiling it and then mining it, data mining, it's all about quantity and it's crude and it's asymmetrical and it's it's just unfair. We can, I think, start to align people around this because there should be a win-win in this. There should be a customer-centric business model or a user-centric business model that does deliver value for business and benefits and value for consumers. We need to start thinking about the quality of data, though. So there are some good tools for this, like in security, we're familiar that security is normally thought of in, in three dimensions, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And that's kind of a really sterile view of data security. It's important, but it misses out on things like what was the user's buy-in to the data? So can we add permissions to that? You know, we've got confidentiality, integrity, availability. Can we add permissions or consent? Can we add things like jurisdiction, which is important in privacy? Can we add originality? I think the most important missing piece in all of this is originality. Like, is data about me that's sloshing around? Did it really come from me? Is it Steve Wilson's data? And when data is presented, how are you sure that it's really me that's presenting the data and not either my delegate, which is cool, or an identity thief, which is way uncool? So originality of data. Now, I'm thinking about these different facets of data because it's the way that we, we treat things like crude oil or a less contentious example, Deborah, might be like clean drinking water. I, I think that data needs to be safe like drinking water. We need to be able to use data just like we use water from a tap without thinking about it because we know that there are people out there that look after the safety of this stuff. You know, under the covers, there should be data pipes that are safe and, and clean, to extend the metaphor, and predictable and well-managed, and that, that's the sort of quite rich metaphor that I think is emerging. And when you can think about data in a really structured way and think about its qualities and its properties, then you can get some really good privacy outcomes because you get data minimization, you get consent built in, and, and you get transparency because one of the really evil things is that people just don't know what's going on with their data. So if we could be more transparent about that, then I think we're getting towards that maturity that we need in data protection. Yeah, and that breeds trust, right? right? I mean, trust not so much in the system itself and the under, but trust in the organization when you have the transparency and yeah. you understand how the process is supposed to work and have some assurances. And so to that point, you know, give us examples of organizations that are really pushing for data sharing. Yeah. Well, we can start at the top. There's a really good publication that came out about a year ago from the World Bank, and um, it's called Data for Better Lives. We could put a link in the show notes, I guess, Deborah, or, or it's a pretty easy thing to Google. Great. So the Data for Better Lives was a big document from the World Bank that, that calls for a new contract, a new social contract for data. So it goes over some of the territory that you and I have just covered, um, how important is data to society and to individuals and to business. And how do we have a better social contract that enables data to be reused in a in a measured and controlled way and, and a symmetrical way to create economic and social value? I love that report. You know, it's a real leadership. But I think a lot of listeners would also be familiar with open banking, which is a big push for the last three or four years out of the UK and Australia in particular, as well as the US and Brazil. Some of those leading emerging economies are really strong on open banking as a way of lubricating the consumer involvement in financial um, affairs and financial products. 
So open banking is there. And look, under the covers, there's a whole lot of interesting uh, protocols that will allow people's data to be portable from one financial provider to another. Now, there's some interesting um, kind of subtext. Open banking has a bit of a laissez-faire philosophy behind it that says that people will be able to get a better deal from service providers and banks if they use their data as a bit of a bargaining chip. And I think as soon as you do that, you are certainly buying into some asymmetries again in business. I mean, the, the thing about big business is that they are more powerful than the little person. And as soon as we put information into that mix and make information like a resource or an asset, I'm, I'm absolutely aware that we need to be careful of, of the asymmetries, especially in information, because, you know, data is complicated. Data science is complicated. I don't think many people really understand how data flows in the internet, but, you know, Facebook and Google, they understand, and um, these people make billions of dollars. Like the richest people in the world in history have made their billions from data, and it's kind of breathtaking. I guess that is true, that the current richest people are probably the richest people in history. So at this point, this is it. I mean, that makes sense. I haven't thought in that context. Wow. And so they're, they're very, very clever. There's teams of thousands of people working on data mining. And, you know, they're not using data to solve cancer. They're using data to find clever ways of selling advertising to people and monetizing that knowledge of the consumer and profiting from it in eye-watering ways. So there are some asymmetries there that we need to be careful of, and I, I know that acutely. And look, a final thing to say about data is a push for publicly funded research data to be made available and shared more equitably. So, you know, when, when the taxpayer is really funding university research and public science research and, you know, clinical trials, there's a really nice push worldwide to have for governments to make the the outputs of that publicly funded research available and shareable and i think that that's a really important sort of policy you know lever that we've got now that's driving a lot of this stuff thanks for that so those are some of the the global pushes for data sharing what do we mean by an information value chain mm-hmm. given that we're talking about trends regarding the sharing of data to facilitate and scale global information value chains? And what is needed for stakeholders to trust them? Yeah, great question. So information value chain sounds a little bit sort of uh, cliquey, but it's the sort of structure that's been forming under our noses for decades, actually. And there's lots of models. There are reports and social science institutes that publish sort of diagrams and copyrighted models for how to visualise this thing. It's simply the case that data moves from stage to stage through the economy, if you like. Data will originate somewhere, it'll be collected somewhere, and then it will be processed and analysed and disseminated. You can think about the mass media supply chain, where reporters and our citizen reporters, you know, people with, with mobile phones in the street are gathering facts and pushing them into Um, aggregators and social media and big media and obviously disrupting the whole journalism business model to to a large extent. But that's an example of a value chain of of data that's that's created and passed from hand to hand and value added all the way along. Now, in things like medical data and population data and things that are public assets, these things, of course, originate through surveys and censuses and research. And the data, again, it goes from stage to stage in a pretty orderly way that it gets um, statistically analysed, it gets interpreted, data forms reports. And so you have that idea that data can get transformed into information and in turn it can get transformed into knowledge. That's a pretty old idea, data, information, knowledge. But what we're seeing in business and in government and in healthcare is a structured way in which data really starts to look like an asset or a resource. You know, it looks like a raw material that's being processed and value added all the way along. And in this information age that we're currently in, the tools are getting more and more powerful. So there are analytics, there are syntheses of data that are utterly transforming data as it moves and making it more valuable 
and I guess in, in the wrong hands also more risky because a lot of these algorithms that can work out health outcomes, for example, can also be used and weaponized against us to be working out things like your insurance risk as an individual or Lord knows what. So the inferences, I think that that's the final step in these value chains, the inferences that are able to be drawn from data these days is what really, to me, characterizes the modern information supply chain. I don't think there's any other way to look at data and personal information other than this supply chain. And um, right or wrong, you know, data is business. Data is big business. And a lot of what energizes me at the moment, Deborah, are new ways of being orderly and transparent about that so that we get, you know, better outcomes and we bring this stuff out of the shadows. So much of this data processing has been has been done surreptitiously. I would absolutely acknowledge the um the work of Zubov on surveillance capitalism. Amazing work exposing how social media in particular is really a, a sort of a covert operation to monetize data. And I'm working hard to bring a lot of that stuff out of the shadows, I guess, for, for, for better privacy outcomes. Amazing. I love the work that you're doing. How do we ensure that these information value chains become and remain orderly, fair and transparent? Well, part of that is actually a technology story or even an engineering story. And and I don't want to get too geeky or too difficult about that, but there are some really cool tools now from cryptography and information management and verifiable credentials that allow people to be much more purposeful in the way that they hold information about themselves and how they control the release of that sort of information. Now, I've been using the term infrastructure lately. It's, you know, it's infrastructure for Ooh, information. I like yeah. I wish it was my term. It's it's not. It was the term was invented about 20 years ago, but it's infrastructure is about how do you treat information as a resource or a, a, a material and how do you protect it? So what are the rules and the technologies and the business models for protecting information as if it was electricity or, or clean drinking water. So infrastructure is part of the answer to your question. Like, how do we make supply chains orderly? I think we we adopt infrastructure and it's happening anyway. The other part of this, of course, is, is rules and regulation and, and just civilization. If data is so important, then we can't just have a Wild West treatment of data or Back to the crude oil analogy, you can't have prospectors driving their equipment, you know, metaphorically through your private land and digging up oil behind your back or digging up data behind your back. Like we need to make that orderly and civilized. So there are some. And in front of my back. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do it in plain view yeah. and do it with permission <laughs> and do it with, a, with sharing the profits. And I, I guess I just want to call out data protection and data privacy laws worldwide. We've got really good principles-based privacy legislation in, in about 130 countries around the world, and it's finally coming to the US. Um, there's really good state statutes now, principles-based statutes. Um, the second-generation law in California, the, the CPRA, the California Privacy Regulation Act, uh, and a number of other states are passing similar laws. And these are broad-based laws that seek to protect data. They seek to control the flow of data. They seek to make sure that people know what information has been collected about them. And this is sort of the modern approach, which is incomplete. There's some very good scholarly work that shows that privacy law is incomplete and the whole concept of personal information should be extended. And I get that, but I also want to say that I reckon 70 or 80 percent of the terrible things that you see on the internet can be moderated and, and you know brought to heel by the laws that we already have, the, the data protection laws that we have. The GDPR is a popular example, but you know, by no means is it the only standard. That there's, like I said, 130 countries around the world with similar laws, and and they by and large function to try and rein in those those excessive abuse of personal information. So you know, what do we do about supply chains? We we use infrastructure to make them um, orderly and predictable. And we use, I think, the right measure of laws and regulations to make it all civilized. Thanks for that. So then how can personal data be shared for 
use for these information value chains while remaining useful for analysis and maintaining the privacy of individuals? I know that's a big question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I want to say something different rather than just repeat myself because a lot of this does have to do with um, transparency and visibility of what's going on. Now, I think some people will actively participate in future. This may still take a generation or two. I see some consumers participating actively in their data and what happens to it and how do you benefit in the in the processing of that data. I think that that's probably still an edge case. I think asking people to participate in their data to that extent is, is a really big ask. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, loyal listeners. The Shifting Privacy Left podcast is seeking sponsors who want to help educate our growing community of privacy engineers. Position your brand in front of privacy engineers, architects, developers, researchers, and privacy tech buyers. Insert a 30 to 60 second ad like this one into every published episode of the podcast. This is dynamic content after all. Feature your new product, an upcoming conference, a sponsored special deal, endless opportunities. Email sponsorship at shiftingprivacyleft.com for more information on our sponsorship package. Okay, let's get back to our engaging privacy conversation. Why is that a big ask? What do you need to surmount in order to make that workable? Or what, where's the challenge? It's a big ask because a lot of it's intangible. It's a bit like healthcare. You can expose people to their health records and you can get them to participate in their healthcare, but a lot of it gets technical and hard and a bit, you know, scary for some people. So a lot of privacy and a lot of data is managed on our behalf by professionals and regulators, similar to to car safety. You know, at some level, we absolutely participate in car safety because we're supposed to be safe drivers and we're supposed to follow the rules. But the fact is that there are rules to follow. And so the community agrees that there's going to be rules for speed limits and car safety. There's going to be a whole lot of technical standards for car safety that nobody really understands. You know, I don't don't buy a car knowing what the strength of the windscreen glass is or the emissions or anything. I just know that somebody's looking after that. So I think data and privacy are similar. You know, privacy is an outcome of nice, limited, safe, proportional handling of data. And a lot of that handling does get very technical in it, and I think it needs to be regulated on our behalf. So that's what I mean by by consumers participating. Meanwhile, huge amounts of data about us is flowing behind our backs. It's it's been created behind our backs. It's used and and filed away and analysed. And by the way, a lot of that is good. You know, if you think about healthcare, if you think about going to hospital, and the and the gigabytes of data that is generated at every hospitalization and all of that stuff about me you know if i've had a surgery my surgeon the anesthetist the doctors my referring doctor the nurses the insurance companies all of these people are sharing data about me let's say behind my back but with my welfare absolutely top of mind so i just make that point to say that a huge amount of data flows we can't expect mom and pop to see that, understand it, control it, own it, it would be a nightmare. And I think a really civilised digital society has ways of making sure that data flows in, a, in an orderly and, and fair way on our behalf. That makes sense. And, you know, you kind of stress that maybe safety is a better umbrella term rather than privacy, making making an app safe, inexperienced yeah. safe to use. I really like this distinction between Privacy applying to an individual's rights, but then safety kind of applies to the use of personal data. You know, is it safe to use without infringing on a privacy right? And I know that Australia has appointed an e-safety commissioner, Julie Inman Grant, and she's an independent regulator focused on online safety. In fact, the Extended Reality Safety Initiative, or XRSI, uh, which is the topic of my very first episode of this podcast, And I'm also the program lead for the privacy and safety framework there. We named our risk framework for the XR industry, the privacy and safety framework or PSF, where we embed the requirements for the commissioner's 
e-safety framework into that because I kind of agree with you, you know, we need, uh, especially when it's coming to consumers or when we're talking about consumers, it kind of makes more sense because we're, we're talking about, you know, moderation, psychological safety, whether or not someone is part of a vulnerable population, embedding diversity and inclusion requirements. Like there's a lot more than just is the data that's attributed to a person secured, right? Right. Like there's so much more that's involved. So to that end, what is, in your opinion, the best regulatory approach to get practitioners to embed safety into their product and technology roadmaps? Deborah, I love the work that you're doing with XRSI, and I love the way that you've just called out the different sort of properties of of data. It, it's fantastic. It, it's really, again, it's giving us new frameworks and standards to to have the conversation about data and the importance. Um, I think the XR industry, the extended reality industry, is at the moment it's dominated by by thinking about augmented reality and metaverse and all of that's cool and very sexy, but I think there'll be a lot of mainstream extended reality as well that is just it's all about data sharing, isn't it? I mean, under the under the yeah. hood, this is all about masses amount of data about people that um needs to be used and shared in a safe way. So to think about this as safety, I think is is a real breakthrough and it brings a lot of people to the table. Julie Inman Grant is doing fantastic work in Australia as eSafety Commissioner. And it's kind of nice to acknowledge too that she comes out of a social media background. She was very senior at Twitter and also at Microsoft. So she's got that industry um, chops, which is making her extremely effective and extremely credible. She's um, almost like a model regulator because she is working to get joint outcomes. You know, win-win is a... (laughs) Is a cliche, but she really working hard to get win wins, and and succeeding. So it's the leading edge of this balance of regulations that we need. Now, regulation is a bit of a dirty word, and and we often over regulate, don't we? And we um go too yeah. far, and then we need to pull it back, and and that's okay. I mean, that's sort of the story of the free market, I guess. We wind up with a with a regulatory equilibrium that is more or less right. And also still allows for innovation. A lot of people in Silicon Valley worry that innovation will, will suffer at the hands of regulation because it sort of ties your hands. But I know plenty of people in the automotive industry who will say that, you know, they're probably the most, or, or aviation, these are the most regulated industries in the world. But there's no shortage of regulation in automobiles and, and aircraft. So I'm very positive about regulation. I think it just speaks to civilization. And um, the right level of regulation is inevitable. It's super important that we do have a balanced view in privacy. Privacy enhancing technologies, for example, have been with us for a long time. The idea that encryption and access control are the sort of the center point of privacy in in some people's minds. But it's such a limited and, and very sterile view of the world. I, I firmly believe that privacy is is more about what you don't do with data than what you do do with data. And if privacy by design means being very purposeful about the stuff that you don't need to know, then that sort of puts technology in the corner. You know, technology is important, and I love this infrastructure idea, but I do think that it's what you don't do with data, and therefore it's more about policy and standards for um, for limiting the use of data, and that will that will give us a nice civilised outcome, I reckon. Yeah. And then those are kind of serve as requirements for like the lowest level of your infrastructure as you're building from the bottom up, I think. Yeah. Of what are you not collecting? What does not go over the network? Um, You know, if you're thinking in terms of restraint, I really like this idea and I'm going to play around more with it as I'm kind of threat modeling and thinking about privacy as a key aspect of product development. But let's turn our attention to the ways in which organizations are facilitating data sharing today and Mm. in the future. Can you describe for us some of the data sharing platforms and business models you've come across in your research? Yes. Well, at Constellation Research, we are developing a new category, which is probably going to turn out to be data protection as a service. It is what it says on the box. That's cool. (laughs) Thank you. It's a pretty broad category. There's a lot of ways into this and a lot of good component solutions out there. 
you know, there are new encryption algorithms, homomorphic encryption. So a quick detour, you know, that we think about encryption of data at rest in databases and we think about encryption in motion so that when data transfers over the web, you've got HTTPS and that sort of protocol. The new leading edge idea is encryption in use. So how do you protect data while it's actually being used and processed and analysed and keep it encrypted? Now, it's a bit of a mind blow, but there are some amazing algorithms, homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryption. So um, what is that? F-H-E is the acronym to look out for. Now, it's very leading edge, and I've got to say I'm not an unqualified fan of fully homomorphic because it's new and it hasn't been totally shaken down yet, and there are compromises involved. So that's cool. We just need to be careful and, and keep studying it. There's also the concept of a data clean room. It's a little bit like a like a mergers and acquisitions deal room that lawyers would be familiar with. Um, you know, you might... Uh, take a whole lot of data about two companies that are coming together and you you put it physically into a room with a lock on the door and you would have a log of the lawyers and advisors and accountants that are allowed to work on a deal and they've got 14 days access to the data before it all gets shredded. And, you know, that's how business works for literally for real world deals. Now, we can do that with technology to do it with data online, virtual clean rooms on the internet. And a number of vendors are providing these services now. Some vendors talk about privacy APIs. So that is an API, a a programming interface where you could get a piece of software to make inquiries over the API into a database in a privacy preserving way. So the whole idea of zero knowledge proof comes in here. So if I want to know the health status of a bunch of people in a community. And if that data is in a is in a clean room, then I could use a data privacy preserving API to make inquiries about the state of the data without any knowledge of who the data applies to. So that stuff is all coming onto the market. And um, I want to say that there's different, um, I don't want to use the word piecemeal, but there's certainly separate and, um, and independent pieces of this puzzle that are coming together under data protection as a service. (laughs) So much innovation in that area. It's great. So I hope to be publishing some research in the new year out of Constellation Research on exactly that topic. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you can be sure that I'll definitely be reading that research. (laughs) And look, let's kick it around as peers. You know, we like to have a a peer community of of research and advisors and reviewers, and I'd love to share that. Ah, There you go. Share. Excellent. I'm in. (laughs) Yeah, sure thing. So we discussed how safety differs from privacy, and you've mentioned a little before about what privacy means to you in this perspective of restraint. But as it relates to Web3 goals like decentralization and data ownership, how would you unpack that a little more for us? What does privacy mean in that context? Yeah, such a good question and such a, you know, I'm going to tread gingerly in this area, Deborah, because because words are powerful. Yeah. Um, Indeed. We use metaphors to describe a lot of this stuff, and sometimes we don't even know that these things are metaphorical. My favourite example is digital identity. Um, A lot of people feel that digital identity is like digitised identity. It's like my avatar that is going to correspond to the real world, Stephen Wilson, and some sort of version of me in cyberspace. And that's somebody's intuition, but... Most digital identity is actually much drier and much smaller than that. It's all about identifiers and customer reference numbers and stuff like that. And you can add all of that up to to, to synthesize a holistic identity of the person. But usually what we're trying to do online is, is kind of transactional and more fine-grained. And that is good, by the way. We've got to remember that keeping different identifiers for different tasks is, is privacy-preserving. It's good to keep all of your little activities siloed. Because then that way you're able to, I guess, decide, choose what yeah. information about yourself that's attached to each of those identities would yep. be shared. Yep. And you can decouple it and you can you can withdraw consent. You know, withdrawing consent is a really hard problem, but the more identifiers we have, the easier it is at least to say to a database, hey, I want I want all of my social media um stuff 
when I've been tweeting about my health, I'd like that all taken out now, please. And you do need to keep things sort of threaded separately. So that brings us to, to decentralization. Like, what do we really mean? What what gets decentralized? I think that decentralization is a pretty cool political slogan. And a lot of it comes out of the anger, the justifiable anger that we have about business and government excesses online. And, and it's is easy to just blame government. And decentralize often means, you know, let's let's break down the establishment. Let's try and reform a fairer society that would be, you know, quote unquote decentralized insofar as it's not run by government anymore. And I sort of get that. I don't think it's going to be really easy. And I think that there's a middle middle ground. What does that middle ground look like at a high level? <laughs> sure. At a high level, I think it's got to do with being really careful about what pieces of data really matter about me and being able to, to control and protect those pieces of data. So, you know, there's facts and figures about me that are super important. A lot of them come from authorities. My health identifiers and my health records and my health status comes from health professionals. And the authority of that information remains centralised. Like, I don't want to make up my own cardiology diagnosis. And certainly, um, if somebody wants to know my health, I can't trust Stephen Wilson to talk about my health. You know, if I change doctors... My new doctor needs to get a summary of my health status from another doctor. So, you know, health information is centralised in terms of where it comes from and how do you trust it, but it should be decentralised insofar as people should have more control and more say over how it gets ported from one provider to another. So there's no simple sense of decentralisation. It's like a mini splendid thing, and I think we're beginning to sort of break it down a bit. The other thing in Web3, of course, is ownership. And um, look, I'm not going to be too ginger about this, actually. I might as well. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I might as well call it out. I, I think that ownership is a really cute metaphor. I like to think that I own my career and um, I own my health. So I'm responsible for my health. And um, if I eat too much, then that's on me. So yeah, look, I own my health. But we all know that that's a metaphor. So what does owning data mean? I, I think owning data can't be taken seriously and literally because data is sort of ephemeral. As I said before, most of the data about me is actually created behind my back, good or bad, mostly good. So how do I own that? If an algorithm works out the risk of me having diabetes and that algorithm is super clever and it's been developed and patented by some data scientists, they, in a commercial sense, have got every right to own the algorithm and they might even think that they own the outputs of the algorithm. And I don't actually take a position on, on that. I don't, I don't want to argue one way or the other. I just want to say it's complicated. So ownership is not what it seems. The positive thing to say about ownership is that we don't need it. The really surprising thing is that you don't need to own data to still get really good privacy outcomes. So I don't know whether we're going to have time, but we could talk about some of the big cases out of Europe yeah, let's do that. First up, tell us about the Facebook Europe case regarding yeah. the collection and use of facial biometrics and the use of auto tech technology without yeah. sufficient consent. Well, it's such a good story here about why principles based privacy law is like a it's like a superpower. You can get some very strong protections of people using laws that are 20 or 30 years old. So what happened there is that um the German regulator in about year 2010, found that Facebook's use of facial recognition, biometric facial matching, and especially their use of tag suggestions was breaking really well-established privacy law. This is pre-GDPR. And the legal principle was facial recognition and facial matching takes an image and a reference image and delivers you an answer about, you know, is this Deborah's face or not? And that answer is actually new information. And the matching has been done without your permission because it's all done by photos in the Facebook matrix. And the German regulator said, hey, the people whose photos are being matched have no say in that. They have not consented to that. And you've got brand new information being, being produced. The final clincher was, was just fascinating. Facebook, of course, had tag suggestions where on your feed, a photo would come up and it would have a helpful arrow saying, hey, we think that this is Steve Wilson. Um, 
can you please confirm if the tag is correct or not? And people thought that was really cool, and it is kind of cool. You know, I've, I've seen it. My kids loved it. It's sort of, you know, it's it's participatory. You're, you're really getting involved with that Facebook conversation. What they did was that they were gamifying the training of the of the algorithms. So training a facial biometric algorithm is hard work. You know, you've, you've got to give it a lot of data, and when it's done in the lab, it's expensive. But <laughs> Facebook crowdsourced and they gamified the training of the algorithms. Now, I think it's sheer genius. I, I don't support it, but I acknowledge how clever that was. The regulators, <laughs> um, <laughs> the regulators thought it was just beyond the pale. And they said, you just can't do that. So the Germans ordered Facebook to stop doing tag suggestions and, and to destroy the biometric data. And Facebook, to be fair, did that without any protest. And they even went further. Facebook shut down tag suggestions worldwide for years and years and years because they realized that it was just radioactive. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. So to, to summarize, it's an old privacy principle about consent and also that information can be collected by an algorithm. You know, it's not necessarily the stuff that you volunteer in a, in a form. But so when the algorithm generates information, it's called collection by creation. So the algorithm creates information and therefore collects it. And the German regulators threw the book at Facebook, pardon the pun. <laughs> threw the book at Facebook. Yeah. I love it. There's also an infamous Google Spain case, right, that originally granted the right to be forgotten or as also known as the right to erasure. Yeah. You know, what can we take away from that case? What lessons learned? I've written a lot about this, Deborah. I think it's an amazing case because it deals with the intuitions that we have about Google and about the web and about Google search or web search. You know, this is not necessarily about Google. The case involved Google, but the outcome of the precedent is all about web search. And I think this is important because we, a lot of us have grown up with the web and the WWW experience and what that means. Now, our intuition is that the web is like an enormous public library, and I think maybe that metaphor gets used. And web search is a way of indexing that colossal public record and putting it up on your screen of your browser. So when Google search was found to have invaded this guy's privacy, here's what the, what the case was about in a nutshell. An individual in Spain objected to um, their name coming up in connection with I think it was a crime or a, a misdemeanor. It was a bad act. And um, this person's sort of history was forever tarnished because every time you did a name search, the first thing that you would get and the second and third thing you would get on Google search was was bad news. Um, and it was associating this guy with a bad event. Now, it doesn't matter whether the bad event was true or not. It doesn't matter if it was slander or, or liable. None of those things were the principle. Um, the principle was that Whatever it was, it was a fact. It was in the public domain and Google was just putting it up on the screen. So that was the intuition. A lot of people who were surprised by the Google right to be forgotten answer said, look, it doesn't make sense to me because Google search is just reporting facts from the public domain. I look at it very differently. I, I think it's an illusion that Google search or web search presents facts. It presents a very carefully curated list of matches against what Google thinks you're interested in. And that's the really key point, that Google's algorithms are trying to work out what you're interested in through a whole lot of other clues so that they can firstly provide, you know, really interesting answers to, to your search and also so they can set up ads. So we've got to remember that this all is driven by ad tech the purpose of search is to serve up ads. And, and deeper than that, I think the sort of scientific purpose of the search engine is that it's an ongoing experiment in mind reading. And if you think I'm being a bit sort of fancy or decorative in my, in my use of the language, think about the fact that your Google search results are different on every computer. If you use your phone or if you're on a web kiosk or using an office computer, the web results are always different. And it's because in the different contexts, it's using different history and different signals to predict out what you would be interested in. So it's they're trying to read your mind and they want to do that because they want to sell you ads. Now, therefore, it's not the case that Google search just 
provides objective facts from the public domain. It, it provides synthetic information. And it just looks like facts and figures, but it's actually not. The Google search result is actually a little story that they have made up using their secret algorithms to try and address the need that you've expressed when you entered a search term. And that's what's really going on. And I think that the Right to Be Forgotten case has exposed that because it said, look, what you've got here is complicated algorithms that are creating whole new stories, whole new pieces of personal information. And under conventional law, and, and again, this was not new law, the Google Spain result drew was drawn on old statutes. And the statute simply said that if you produce personal information from people, fresh personal information, then you're responsible for the collection and use and life cycle of that, of that data. And I, th I think that it's fascinating that it exposes this idea that what looks like facts and figures, it looks like newspaper print or it looks like a like a TV screen, doesn't it? But it's not just facts, it's, it's synthesised facts and um, we've got every right to want to have some control over that. That's an excellent point. And I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about search quite in that way, that it's like synthesised story using secret algorithms. It's so clever. And look, I love it and I couldn't live without it, but it is, it's so clever. It looks like it's facts and figures, but it's really a very complicated story that they put together. That's a great point. And so speaking of story put together by big tech and with Twitter's current takeover by Elon Musk, which I will call an implosion and we won't discuss <laughs> here because there's just not enough time. What are the expectations of privacy in a proverbial digital town square? And for First Amendment purposes, I do not think Twitter is a town square. But for the concept of this is where people are going to have public conversations. Mm. What are the expectations of privacy in the digital town square that that is the Internet or on Twitter, however you want to bound it, the question? Absolutely. It exposes some of these other intuitions about what is privacy and what is secrecy and confidentiality, for example. So privacy is a broad topic and, and confidentiality is just one part of it. Our intuitions about the internet and the town square are really very counterintuitive. Or, or our intuitions are, are bad and they're false because you know we, we did not grow up on the internet and it doesn't matter how good Web3 and Web5 gets, we're still not living in the internet. We're, we're experiencing the internet as if we're watching TV. I mean, let's be honest that the experience of the World Wide Web is very much like watching TV with 10 million channels. Um, My browser tabs are all open right now. There you go. <laughs> Unlike with there TV, you know, I, could, I could scale better in, in the browsers by having so many open. Yeah. 106 open tabs, oh dear. Oh um, my goodness. The funny thing about the town square is that it's actually a really cool secret place. You know, the old spy movie trope of meeting in the town square and having a having a discussion because you, you're almost certainly not going to be overheard. Obviously, Twitter and nothing on the internet is like that, especially because Twitter looks like it's a community, but it's, of course, an experience that's curated and provided and served up by software run now by Elon Musk. And Twitter really only exists so that it can instrument us as a verb, it instruments what we do. It's what I mean, Facebook is the even better example. Facebook provides games and marketplaces and communities and dialogues in order for Facebook to watch what you do and to monetize that. So there is absolutely no secrecy going on there. Now, can you still have privacy in that circumstance? Yes, you can. You can ironically be very, very private in a legal sense in these mediums, if those mediums following the regular law are being restrained in what they do with the data about you. And look, social media, serving up ads, a lot of it's pretty good. And I'm not going to ban advertising in my perfect world. I'm just going to make it clearer to people that when you're on Facebook and you do things and you express an interest in something, then you can expect to get an ad. Now, that's kind of obvious. And I think a lot of people are now pretty down with that. Uh, they understand it. But there's a lot of much, much more subtle stuff going on. You know, the reason why Facebook does facial recognition so well, and they have spent billions of dollars in R&D, and they've spent billions of dollars in buying companies. The reason why they do that is that facial recognition gives them a whole new instrument for watching what you do. 
because they've got, what is it, I think it's 10 billion photographs of people in the public domain doing stuff. I'm not even a Facebook member, but they probably know um, where I have breakfast and when I have breakfast and who I have breakfast with. And so they know what I like, even though I've never pressed like on anything in Facebook in my life. <laughs> they, they know what I like. And um, that's the sort of thing that's very difficult to manage using consent, especially when I'm not even a member. So I think that this town square thing is going to be exposed and and remodeled and we're going to use different metaphors to, to really talk about what's going on, especially when, when we get into Web 3 and 5 and the metaverse. Um, the metaverse is a lovely idea. And I think the work you're doing on, on trying to give it some structure and some standards is just top rate, Deborah. But at this stage, the metaverse is it's like a three-dimensional TV screen in some cases that is being served up by platforms and the motivation of those platforms is entirely commercial. Makes sense as to why there's a potential danger for the building of these systems. We don't, you're right, we don't quite yet have the immersive experience, fully immersive experience that the quote unquote metaverse is sold to us as. So yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to put some guardrails in place before we do. And I love your description of you know, the need for transparency and clarification and the need to gain trust from users so they understand what's happening and they can trust you to with their personal information. I know we could go on for hours and hours just uh, just <laughs> geeking out to privacy, and I'm absolutely plan to have you on a future episode interview. But for now, I want to thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us today on Shifting Privacy Left. Do you have any calls to action? How could people contact you? What do you want to say to everyone before we close up today? Thanks for having me. I'm delighted. You can follow me. I'm Steve underscore Lockstep. My website is lockstep.com.au. Um, I want to say to stay positive. I think that there's a whole new clarity that's emerging around privacy and, and data and the information economy. I think that we're working out privacy engineering. You know, that's not just privacy for engineers. It's about engineering complicated requirements and privacy is one of those requirements. And how do we how do we strike the right balance? The work of the regulator in Australia and elsewhere, I want to call that Michelle Dennedy, another really powerful person in, in privacy engineering. Love her. Um, we, <laughs> we all do. It's amazing work to just make this stuff tangible and let people own it. <laughs> we all own privacy as, as doers and makers and policy people and lawyers and engineers. We all own privacy and now we can figure out why. In the past, it's just been the, le the legal or the compliance um, responsibility and we know that we've all got a role to play. So we can all own privacy and, and I think that that's reason to be cheerful. I agree. I'm optimistic about it as well. And uh, it's why I named my podcast Shifting Privacy Left. I think the time is now when companies are finally realizing it's not just about a compliance paper chase, but how do you prevent the compliance problems, the privacy harms? How do you do the threat modeling? How do you, you know, build for trust? So that's a really, really great point. Well, until next Tuesday, everyone, when we'll be back with engaging content from another great guest. Awesome. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks for joining us this week on Shifting Privacy Left. Make sure to visit our website, shiftingprivacyleft.com, where you can subscribe to updates so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found this episode valuable, go ahead and share it with a friend. And if you're an engineer who cares passionately about privacy, check out Privato, the developer-friendly privacy platform and sponsor of the show. To learn more, go to privato.ai. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday for a new episode. Bye for now.